All right. I think we'll I think we'll get started now. Welcome everyone to this online workshop getting started with secondary data analysis. My name is Maureen Haker. Um, I've been working with the UK Data Service for over 10 years now on everything from ingest to reuse projects, and I specialize in qualitative data. Um, and I also teach at University of Suffolk. I teach things like research methods and sociology. And I'm here with my colleague, Nigel. Nigel, did you want to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Nigel. So I'm, I've been with the UK Data Service for three years. Um, my kind of specialist area is probably the census, but um, I'm a kind of quantitative and qualitative social scientist and do a variety of things. So we're planning to talk for around, um, it's about an hour or so, isn't it, Nigel? And we do have a couple of yeah. exercises scattered in there as well um, to keep it a bit more interactive. Um, but I think that is all of our housekeeping. So it's back over to you, Nigel. Okay, so in the first section, I'm going to talk about um, reusing secondary quantitative data. Um, and what I'm going to cover is what is secondary data um, the ways we might reuse it. And then we're going to pass look at some examples of that, think about key issues, and Maureen will do a parallel session for qualitative data. And at the end, we'll pick up any questions. We might pick up some at the end of this session uh, relating to anything I'm saying. Um, so there's a poll now to say how many of you have reused data and what type. Okay, so... Um, I suppose the largest group haven't reused data, and quite a few of you have used both quantitative and qualitative data. So if we move on from there. Let's just go through some basic stuff about it. So um, what is secondary data? Um, well, typically the data we hold is based on national surveys. We do have some other kind of data sets as well that I, I will talk about as we go through. But the bulk of our collections and the ones that people mostly use are collected either on behalf of government departments, uh, a major centre in Essex Understanding Society, or by agencies like Natsen who carry out research on behalf of, um, of key national stakeholders. They design the collection uh, and collect the data, and some of them are analysed for particular purposes. So, for example, the English Housing Survey is used by the department. Sorry, I have to, um, I don't remember the latest name. It was levelling up. It has been communities and local government. But they use that to help plan housing um, policies. And all of that data is then made available to um for secondary research. So we can then look at that for a different purpose. Um, and there are some kind of pros and cons of, of using this, just to think about. So first of all, I mean, these data sets are large and they're probably impossible for us to create as um, individual or even groups of researchers. They're cost effective because we, in effect, they're free to us. Um, and a lot of the ethical issues about data collection are dealt with. So there are controls already built into the data to um, minimize, for example, uh, individual identification of respondents. Uh, we don't need to go back to ask the data subjects permission to use the data. Um, we can use it um, to make claims. But there are some things we need to think about. So first of all, we don't really have the insider understanding of the data and data collection. Um, a lot of the um, surveys will have documentation explaining about that. But we need to get to grips with that. We also don't necessarily understand the data or need to invest some time. Um, and there are still some ethical issues that we need to consider. So um, an example I've used in the past has been the Understanding Society COVID way, um, which was used to kind of post stories about um, vaccine hesitancy amongst um, particular ethnic groups. And actually that 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 analysis looked pretty flawed because the um, the groups eligible for vaccine at that point were over 70 and there were 
very minimal number of respondents of that age within the survey itself. Um, the big one, I suppose, is that the data that they, is collected may not be an exact fit within our for our research question, and we can't don't have the option to go back and extend the studies. So some things to think about. Um, so for us, we need to uh, invest time and effort in understanding the data and to be pragmatic about how good it is for our purpose. Um, now, typically, we all start with a research um, methodology that assumes this is a kind of fairly clear cycle process that we go from a research question, we find the data, we evaluate it and analyze it. But as we go through this, we'll learn that this is a lot more messy. So we start with a research question and we locate data, but it may not be an exact match, so we may rephrase our research question. As we look in more detail at the data, we may then go back again. Um, and then we, as we analyze it, we could go back to evaluating it again, to finding more data or to revising the research question. So it's a messy process um, that, Kind of consumes a lot of time. So the the next thing to think about is how do we find data? Um, and I'm going to go through an example, but we have uh, a catalog search, we have some theme pages, you can go back to previous webinars. So if there's been a webinar on a particular study you're interested in, um, and we are investing time in producing lots more asynchronous materials to help people um, kind of study by themselves or find things by themselves. So I'm just briefly gonna stop sharing and locate the UK Data Service website. So if you, so I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and start sharing the UK Data Service website. So being a good person, I'm gonna accept the analytics and take you through what we have. So. Um, to find data, we can go into here. Um, we also have the learning hub that has lots of materials uh, to help you. So introductory modules uh, on how to use data, data skills modules, some information about different types of data. So a useful place to go. But what I'm going to look for is um, data from a survey called EVENS, which was evidence for national equality carried out by um, a cent the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity. And um, when I look at it, there is a teaching data set. Um, so if we go into the teaching data set, we can see here information about the title, um, the access requirements, and um, citation which I'll go over later on again. Um, an abstract, which tells you a lot more about the survey, information about the coverage and methodology. And going across the top, you can, there are three tabs. You've got documentation. So there's a data dictionary, a user guide, um, the citation. And within this particular study, there are some resources. There's a free ebook, which goes with this. Um, so you can access that from here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, you're going to go and find your way around that yourself. So we'll go back to the presentation and move on from here. So if you have any questions as we go through, as Maureen said, just um, put them in the Q&A and we'll pick them up. So the, we need to, first of all, make sense of our data. Um, so... That means looking at that documentation, I've quickly highlighted how to get at, thinking about what information was collected from whom, when and where, and the way that data has been manipulated um, before being archived. So we get a set of individual responses to questions, and then they may have been processed and things done to them. Um, and in the documentation, we'll have typically a user guide, the original questionnaire, interview schedules, um, information about when the data was collected, etc. Um, so we're going to move on to a practical activity. Now, Jill will put the link in. Um, and this activity is designed to get you looking at um, 
the British Social Attitude Survey and some of the documentation to answer some questions. So um, whilst you're doing that, we're going to give you 15, 20 minutes. I'll check with you how you're getting on and um, we'll then reflect on the responses to that. So over to you with the question. If you have any... Okay, so um, let's go back to what was what we're, we're looking at then. So um, the COVID-19 teaching data set, um, the observation unit for the survey were households and individuals. Um, so individuals within households. So both is the answer. Um, the coverage is um, the United Kingdom. And there are a number of topics covered here. The main ones cited in the overall guide are sociodemographics, whether working at home and homeschooling, COVID symptoms, health and well-being, um, social contact, neighbourhood cohesion, and volunteering. Uh, you may found have found other things um, in the user guide because there's quite detailed information within this survey. Um, it then asks you to go and look at the catalog page for a particular study associated with with this. Um, and this study covered England and it was based on telephone interviews and the kind of data recorded is text. So hopefully you um, got that sorted out. Okay, so, so we've gone through the demonstration. So let's think about the types of analysis that we can look at. So the units we've talked about in that example, they can be individuals, families, households, and businesses. And if we're looking at that data at one point in time, um, we would be looking at a cross-sectional survey. So typically the British Social Attitude Survey, which we'll talk about later on, the English Housing Survey, um, are cross-sectional services, but surveys, but they're repeated. So there's there are different selections of people each time and um, the same individuals may be sampled, but there's a random element to that. So those types of cross-sectional surveys um, are either one-offs, as was the first survey I showed you, the Evans one, or repeated, but with different sample groups. Um, the next one, which we looked at there, the Understanding Society, is part of a longitudinal data set that was taken during COVID. So I think there were seven waves um, asking, um, inviting the same people to complete the questionnaire so that you could look at change over time. Uh, we also have data that covers small geographic areas. So if you think of a national survey, it doesn't particularly have a geography to it. We might be able to attach geographical types to it, um, but the kind of detailed level of geography we get from census aggregate data and flow data. And we also have international time series data sets like the World Bank data set, which is collected from um, countries and is being collected over time. So I think that data set probably goes back to something like 1960. And here is an example of a repeated cross-sectional survey. So this is the British Crime Survey. It's come about because in understanding crime, um, we found, researchers have found that the statistics collected by the police are not, don't collect much about how people feel about things. They, they don't necessarily identify um, people's experiences of crime because people don't always report them. Um, so it's an annual survey, uh, around 35,000 individuals over 16 and 3,000 uh, younger people. Um, and it identifies people who have been a victim of crime in the previous month, 12 months. So you get some idea of the proportion of people who experience crime. And it covers demographics, attitude to the police and the criminal justice system. Um, the data is stored as individual anonymized records, and there are two levels of access. So there's a standard end user license, which is available to um, people who are registered with the UK data service. Um, and there's a secure access where we get into more detailed information 
where you would need to be accredited. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But this is the type of data you would get. So um, you would have a row that would include um, responses to the questions, um, and each row reflects an individual. And then we would have all of the rows from the data set. A particular study that used this looked at, at violence against people with disabilities in England and Wales. Um, used the British Crime Survey 2009-10, and because that had an introduction of disability men, uh, measures. So looking at this, the findings were that disability increases the risk of violence and high, was highest amongst those with what were classed as mental health problems, um, which suggests that um, taking that up to national level, that 116,000 people experience violence um, that is based on their disability. So when we take samples, when we take a survey, we use a sample. Um, there's a question there here about how representative that sample is. So who's included? Does it include people, for example, in um, what we would call communal establishments? Um, is it restricted to adults? And what's the response rate and bias? Um, so typically if one group of people, I think young men quite often are, are less likely to complete surveys, then do we need to apply an adjustment to represent that group more in the waiting, in the in the survey. And an important consideration in areas I research around race. So um, it's quite important that we have enough cases to make precise estimates. And this is particularly problematic when we come to subpopulations within the survey. Um, we'd ask you to always cite the data. Um, when you look at the the data sets, we provide a citation for every um, data set we provide and use the, you can use the citation tool to copy and paste it into your, um, into your report. So here is an example from the British Social Attitude Survey. Um, the next bit I'm going to go through quite quickly, but because I'm kind of um, a bit thrown by having missed the timing on the last one. Um, so, Who's asked what? So um, typically, I suppose many years ago, I did the labour force survey and had somebody visit me in my house and kind of ask me, but using a computer. So it's computer aided interviewing. Um, so that enables people to be sent through the questionnaire by different routes. I think since COVID, we've had a lot more remote collections. So the later surveys quite often give you an option to do them online um, and you would be routed to the questions that are relevant to you, for you, or in some cases, there will be sub modules that some people will be asked and others won't. So if we look at this, this is a typical kind of what somebody asking the question would see, and it's asking about working arrangements. And there's a set of conditions for why you would be asked this. Um, what happens then to the data is we, derive a number of variables. So this is where understanding what the variable means um, is quite important. So in this um, example, we're seeing whether somebody works a zero hours contacts, contract, um, and it goes through a series of decisions to say whether somebody does work a zero hour contract or not. So it's looking at the three responses, if they're missing, then the data is missing. Um, if any of the responses are seven, which is a zero hours contract, then they have a zero hours contract. Um, we also have data from the 2021 census for England and Wales and Northern Ireland and the 2022 census um, when the full fields are available. And there are four types of data from all of those. Um, there's aggregate data, which is univariate, and multivariate defined tables, boundary data if you're mapping, uh, micro data, which is a sample of individual census returns, so you can do more complex um, multi-level analysis, and flow data, which looks at um, origin and destination data to help analysis of commuting, migration, student term time and home address, and second addresses. And just an example here of 
modelling done by that was looking at housing deprivation by ethnicity in Europe arrival in the UK. So each of the blocks of bars reflect a different ethnic group, and then the bars across reflect the um, year that people came to the UK. So the first grey bar is born in the UK. Um, and apart from the first bar, you can see there is a general pattern that more recent migrants are more likely to be housing deprived. Um, the first bar reflects the fact that the groups of households that are most likely to be housing deprived tend to be those with children. So um, those with children born in the UK are more likely to be deprived. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to pause and see if there's anything in the Q&A. If there's not, then I'll pass over to Maureen. Lovely, thank you. Let me switch over to my screen. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about very similar things as Nigel, but specifically for qualitative data. So first I'm gonna go through a few different types of qualitative data reuse. And one of those um, is going to be exemplified through a case study uh, uh, called School Leavers Study. Um, I'm also gonna show you some of the tools that we have that are qualitative specific, including QualiBank, which is a tool for browsing and searching for data. Um, for qualitative data specifically. And then I'll go through a couple of uh, key issues in reusing qualitative data, including recontextualization. Um, it, reusing qualitative data historically hasn't been quite, it, it's not quite as much part of how qualitative researchers work as it is for quantitative um, researchers. And I know some of you do mixed methods as well. So there's there's a whole spectrum. But generally speaking, if you're using quantitative data, it's quite nice to have access to that representative sample uh, of a nation. Um, that's not always something that's as prioritized within qualitative work. So historically speaking, qualitative data sets aren't always uh, as reused as quantitative. However, this is a changing picture. So um, as we start to digitize and enhance and actually create, you know, have data that is born digital, it's much easier to be able to access that data. You no longer have to go into the dusty stores of an archive in order to access it. Um, and moreover, uh, researchers are using a much wider range of tools, um, both analytical tools as well as um, uh, data gathering tools. So we've started to see some of the benefits of being able to reuse data, um, specifically being able to get hard to reach data, whether it's because of the data type it is or whether it's because of the population. Um, so if you're looking at institutionalized voices, for example, those in care homes or, or children or, or um, something like that, um, it's much easier to be able to reuse a high quality data set than it is to try and get the ethical approval to be able to do new research um, on it. So it is something that we're definitely seeing a lot more of, um, particularly within the last 10 years or so. All right, so let's have a look at how qualitative data has been reused. Um, so there are many ways of reusing qualitative data. You can quite simply just give a description um, or an understanding of a particular social and historical point in time. And this is useful because you can see more of the data than just what the publications will reveal. You might not be able to see all of the data depending on what's available in the archive, but you can certainly see more than just what was originally published. And so you won't be limited to what researchers thought was salient for their research questions and topics. You can actually probe that data further and, and um, see what would be of interest to your questions. Another way to reuse qualitative data is to consider analyzing the methods used and look at what lessons might be gleaned about the effective ways of sampling or data collection methods, or even developing topic guides, for example. One thing that's especially valuable is to look at, you know, how an interview was laid out before the interview was conducted. So what sorts of questions did interviewers think they were going to ask? And then look at what was actually asked in the interviews. And there can be a lot of 
reasons why certain questions are or are not asked in interviews and designing those interview schedules um, is a bit of a skill. So they're meant to be flexible, um, but having that intuition to know what to ask and when is something that can be really hard to learn and teach unless you can actually see an, an example of it. So uh, in any case, it's important for researchers to have these sorts of skills. Um, so we often see qualitative uh, data sets being reused um, to look at the methods um, and also to incorporate them into teaching research methods. Another type of reuse is called reanalysis. And this is the wide range of approaches that you can take in analyzing a data set. So this is, I think, typically what people think of when they think of secondary analysis. And it usually means asking some kind of different research question from what the original researchers were trying to do. So one example of this is uh, a study from Clive Seal and Charteris Black, um, who did a study using a comparative keyword analysis of illness narratives. Now, the original illness narratives had been looked at exclusively for health research. They were really interested in um, diagno how diagnoses are made. When Seal and Charteris Black came along to do the comparative keyword analysis, they were much more interested in an analysis of the discussions between the doctors and the patients, rather than the actual health issues that came up in the interviews. So the question can be very different in that kind of way. Or sometimes a research question can be on a similar topic to the original research, but have a slightly different focus. So for example, Joanna Bornat looked at gerontology as a topic, and she found you know, two different data sets looking specifically at gerontology. However, Bornat's research question was on racism within gerontology, which wasn't the focus of the original work, but those data sets were rich enough to allow her to explore that theme within that existing data. And the final type of reuse, which is going to be exemplified with the case study I'll go through with you, is a restudy. And this is where you replicate the methods of a study for purposes of comparison. So you might be looking to do, for example, a historical comparison, um, which could help you demonstrate how society has changed over time, or it could be geographical, or you could look at social class or gender, or any other kind of comparison, um, just to show what the differences are between subgroups. So when you're using uh, secondary data within that kind of work, sometimes it's literally not possible to collect all of the data you want, especially if you're doing something like a historical comparison, right? You can't go back in time and collect more data. Um, other times it just, uh, as Nigel was kind of indicating, um, it just saves time and money. You don't have to collect more data. You can use what's there and build upon it if you want to. So here is an example of a restudy, and this is from a project called School Leavers Study. So the original study was conducted by Ray Paul in the late 70s as part of a much wider community study on the Isle of Sheppey. Uh, the UK Data Service holds a number of collections that's related to this community study, but the School Leavers Study specifically looked at student aspirations. So Paul sort of stumbled upon an assignment that teachers at the local school had set. Um, and it was asking students to write an essay just before they were due to leave school, prompting them to imagine that they were reaching the end of their life and something made them think back to the time that they left school. And they were then assigned to write the essay um, of what happened in their life over the next 30 to 40 years. So in 2009, 2010, Graham Crow and Don Lyon, and this is a picture with Graham Crow there, um, standing with Ray Paul, who's holding his book, Divisions of Labor. Um, but they decided they were gonna reanalyze that data set and, and focus specifically on the student aspirations, what they wanted to do in their life. So using that same methodology, they conducted a restudy of school leavers for students on the Isle of Sheppey in the academic year 2009-2010. So the prompt that was supplied to students was very similar. Imagine that you're at the end of your life and you reflect back on what you've done since leaving school. 
And they then transcribed those essays and compared the themes from the set of essays collected by Ray Paul to the set of essays that they collected. And you can see the wording of the prompt um, and a small snippet of one of those essays here. Now, there was a challenge to doing this restudy. So when Ray Paul collected the data initially, he sort of stumbled upon finding teachers who had assigned the essay, and they were able to share those essays with him, but he didn't have absolute control over how the essay was presented um, and how it was collected from students. So the originals actually show some of the markup from teachers because they were graded essays. When Graham Crow did the restudy, however, they were not marked. You can probably imagine there would be ethical issues with that. And the research team had much more control over the essay prompt. So Graham Crow goes into some detail about this in his publications, and he did devise the prompt based on conversations with Ray Paul about the original study. Um, you know, uh, Crow eventually kind of comes to the conclusion that the overall picture painted by the essays as a collective still offers a valuable comparison, even if there is um, some methodological uh, issues with, with doing an absolute restudy like that. And the findings did show a shift in aspirations, as you might imagine. So here's a few more details about the, what they received back. So there was a slightly different gender divide, but a similar amount of data that was received. And both data sets covered the same general themes of health, education, career, and family and leisure, but they covered them in very different ways. But how exactly were they different? Well, in 1978, students expected much more grounded and arguably mundane sorts of jobs. Career progression was gradual and it followed on from uh, hard work. And sometimes there were talks of periods of unemployment or even quite morbidly death or the early death of someone they loved. And you can see a few examples in the left column there of quotations from those essays, such as the one at the bottom. I longed for something exciting and challenging, but yet again, I had to settle for second best. I began working in a large clothes factory. 2010, however, showed students imagining well-paid and instantaneous jobs filled with choice, but also with some uncertainty. Crow and his research team also noted a clear influence of celebrity culture in those essays. So for example, you have the quote on the bottom of a girl who writes, in my future, I wanna become either a dance teacher, a hairdresser, or a professional show jumper horse rider. If I do become a dancer, my dream would be to dance for Beyonce or someone really famous. The impact of the study, however, spans beyond some of the interesting changes that they've noted in young people's aspirations. So the re-study was part of a much bigger community project on the past, present, and future of the Isle of Sheppey. So the goal was to engage the community alongside the research and find innovative ways of including participants in research outputs. So as part of that initiative, they published this website, Living and Working on the Isle of Sheppey website. Um, and it's got videos and artwork produced by residents uh, of the Isle of Sheppey, as well as for those who participated in the research to stay in touch with each other and read about the history of their community. And they, you know, in doing this, they help to create a shared history and memory of what living on the Isle of Sheppey means for that community. So hopefully you are now thinking about the different types of projects you might do with qualitative data, but how might you go about finding qualitative data? In terms of searching for data, qualitative data poses a bit of a challenge. So interview transcripts, essays, and other types of qualitative data often hold far more information than what a summary abstract might say on a catalog page. So you might be missing out on a whole range of collections that potentially could touch on the topics that you're interested in, simply because nobody has the time to sit there and read all of the data for every qualitative collection that we have. So we have a tool uh, that we've developed at the UK Data Service, which can help with this, and it's called QualiBank. So like the data catalog, you would simply type in a keyword into the search bar, but instead of searching through abstracts and catalog pages like the data catalog does, QualiBank actually searches through the data itself. 
So when you click on the search button uh, on the data catalog, you'll get a link to QualiBank appear underneath the search button. So you can just click that, or you can also just type in ukdataservice.ac.uk forward slash QualiBank. So with this tool, you might be able to identify relevant interviews that might be spread across uh, different collections or find a collection where you didn't think that that theme might actually come up. Um, so in this example, I've typed in typhoid and you can see that it's searched through and highlighted uh, in the data itself where that's mentioned. So the first couple of hits were from a collection called the Morale and Home Intelligence Reports Collections. So these are historical papers from World War II. But further down, there were also examples from our Edwardians interviews. Um, but typhoid, if you typed it into the data catalog, wouldn't necessarily bring these up. That's not typically a, a term that's used within uh, the abstract or uh, topics on our data catalog pages. So when you click on one of those search results in QualiBank, so I clicked on one of the interviews from the Edwardians that had come up, it brings you straight to the interview, to the spot in the data where your keyword is mentioned. And if you scroll to the top of the page, you can also see that there are links to external resources and collection documentation. And if you click on one of those, it would bring you to the bottom of the page, which would include things like audio extracts of the transcripts, images related to the interview, or sometimes there might also be web resources. Um, it just depends what's available and what's a related resource to that particular collection. Finally, one of the last features of QualiBank, if you wanted to cite directly from the interview transcript, you can see that there's a Create Citation button in the left-hand menu. Um, so if you were to click on that, you then click, hi, uh, click on the um, utterance of the interview transcript or the paragraph that you're interested in citing. And that Create Citation button would turn into a Retrieve Citation button. So the, uh, you'd be able to click on that and you'll see this kind of pop up. So you can just copy and paste that citation into your document. And it has what we call a persistent identifier. Um, so this is things like a, like a DOI, which is uh, the URL that you see at the very end there. So if your reader were to click on that URL, it would bring them to QualiBank, and if they sign in, they'd be able to see the exact paragraph that you've highlighted within QualiBank. So this is quite interesting because it introduces a new layer of transparency into your work, and it also helps you accurately cite the data that you're reusing. So rather than just signposting someone to the general collection, you can signpost them to the the specific paragraph that you're pulling from. Um, and often with qualitative work, that kind of context is really important to understanding interpretation um, and accurately understanding um, the results that someone is trying to present. So uh, it, it's a really useful tool. Okay, so we've covered the different types of reuse projects that you can do, how you can find and access qualitative data, but what about the process of actually analyzing the data? So the first thing that you need to do is orient yourself to the original research project. And I think the main point here to make is that <clears throat> you, not, you shouldn't underestimate the amount of time that it will take to get acquainted with the data set. There might be multiple levels of context to get through in order to really understand that data. And what I mean by that is that you might have more than just the data that's collected at the time of the interview or, or whatever the data collection type is, but you might also need to consider, for example, the metadata of the participant, so who they are, what, what is their social positioning, or you might need to understand the historical time period in which the data was collected or where the data was collected. So really the idea is that you need to understand the data set as a whole in order to really get at the root of what the data can convey. So the documentation that's provided with each of the data sets that Nigel, Nigel showed you that documentation tab um, on each of the data catalog pages, that's a really useful starting point for that process. 
And that uh, documentation often contains more information about the methodology. So it might include things like an interview schedule or a call for participants, or sometimes it includes segments from publications that arose from the original study, or I've also seen things like funding applications. I've seen some studies where they have sections that are written up by the principal investigator about a particular feature of the data set, such as the sample. Um, so for example, Annette Lawson conducted a study in the 1980s on adultery. And given the sensitivity of the topic, particularly at the time, the sampling became a real primary focus for her. So she ended up writing a 56 page document just on her sample. This wasn't something that ended up in a publication. It was just something that got included with the documentation, but she was highly criticized for a biased sample. So she, she went through in quite some detail a comparative between her sample and a national representation. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it, she comes up with some interesting theoretical points about sampling. In my time working with qualitative data sets at the UK Data Service, I've also seen background contextual material that's taken from the area of research, like meeting minutes, government pamphlets, letters from participants, and all of those sorts of things can help paint the picture of what was going on around the study. And all of that could get included uh, in the documentation. You might also need to consider the sample. Um, so, for example, if the data set's too large, you might need to take a subsample of it. Now, this I know is usually not much of an issue with qualitative research, since they're usual, uh, usually smaller studies anyways, but there are some collections which did get a large amount of funding, and you'll need to carefully consider what's feasible for your project. So, for example, the Edwardians collection, which was put together by Paul Thompson and is widely considered to be the first oral history of Britain, contains 453 80 plus page interviews. Um, so that would take a considerable amount of time to read and reread, become acquainted with, and then actually start the analysis. So you'd probably want to take a sample um, of that particular data set. Conversely, you might find interviews from different data sets which complement each other um, and you know, you'd want to make a new larger data set that is more useful to you if you combine them, something like Joanna Bornat did in her study on gerontology. Finally, you'll need to think through how you will approach the data. So you might be using an inductive strategy where you start with the data and then see what comes from that. Or you might take a deductive strategy where you have a firmer idea of what you're looking for in the data. Um, and, and you're a little bit more pointed about what kind of data you're including. Both are quite equally valid, but you need to consider your approach as you get started. So this is meant to be quite a brief overview of a couple of the key issues when you're getting started with qualitative data reuse. If you're looking for more guidance or discussion on these issues, there's a couple sources that I highly recommend. First and foremost is the SAGE Handbook of Qualitative Secondary Analysis. Um, from Karen Hughes and Anna Terrence. Um, it's a comprehensive guide to some of the issues around things like recontextualization and sampling. Um, there's also a short single chapter out of Silverman's um, most recent edition of Qualitative Research. So Libby Bishop wrote that chapter specifically around reusing qualitative data, and it's filled with further examples of reuse and addresses some of those key issues in more depth. And if you have access uh, to that book through your library, I'd recommend starting with that chapter. Um, there's also a Timescapes Methods Guide series, which is available online. So those are really short. They're just a few pages each. Um, and there's one guide in particular, number 19, from Sarah Irwin and Mandy Winterton, um, which is another great guide just to get you started. So now we've got um, a practical activity. I think uh, Jill will be able to pop into the chat um, your um, worksheet for this. Um, but basically, I'm going to direct you to an open data set called Pioneers of Social Research, um, get you to uh, download our what we call the download bundle. And that has all of the documentation and data. 
And the worksheet is going to ask you to find a couple of things within that download bundle. So I'm gonna um, give you about, um, about eight minutes or so just to have a, a search through that download bundle, see what, what the files look like, see if you have any questions about how to do it. You shouldn't need to register or sign in in order to view this, it's all open access. Um, and then when we come back, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a tour. I'll share my screen and give you a little bit of a tour of the download bundle and just kind of explain what those look like, uh, where you can find things. Um, but hopefully you should be able to find everything on this checklist. So I'll give you uh, some time for that now. If you do have questions as you go along, feel free to pop those in the chat and we can always troubleshoot those um, uh, in a few minutes. When you download the, the bundle, you'll notice that this download bundle was called an RTF. So the download bundles are titled based on the kind of file format that they're in. So if you're trying to download a quantitative data set, you'll see that you have options of, for example, um, SPSS or Stata or Tab Delimited. Um, and for qualitative collections, you normally have an RTF and a PDF option. So this one was in an RTF format. RTF is, is basically a Word document, but it's the non-proprietary form of Word document. So you'll notice that all of our Word files, even if they have the little Word logo, um, are RTFs. It's considered an archival format because it's non-proprietary. Um, so we tend to use RTFs rather than dot doc or dot docx. Um, some of the self-deposit systems, you'll get bundles that are that are saved in in dot doc, but we we tend to ask depositors to switch them to RTF. So once you open this up, you'll see that you've got your RTF folder and you've got another fol folder called MR doc. Nigel, I don't know if you know this, why it's called MR doc. I know some of the other titles though are by file format. Um, there's also other files in our copies of these download bundles that have like RF, which is called red folder. And it's based on when we had paper-based systems, um, the, the kind of administrative documents would be held in a red folder. So it's an RF folder. Um, or we also have uh, folders called core for correspondence. I'm not sure where MR comes from in MR doc. No, I've got, I haven't got an idea. To yeah. Yeah. It might, it might be based on a paper-based system, yeah. um, something about it, or typically it's the, it's the format is how we title them. So you'll see there's uh, copies uh, in PDF and in Excel. Um, so I've gone into the PDF to open up our U list, which is what we call the user list, um, also called the data listing. So I've opened this up. And we can see here, these are all of the participants. Each one has their own row. And you get a few um, uh, characteristics about them in the columns. Um, so if we're looking for Stan Cohen, we can see that Stan Cohen um, is interviewee five. So it's very systematic in the way those file names are titled. Um, so int is for interview, DRY is for diary, um, sum is for uh, summary, um, so on and so forth. So, so we tend to use the same kind of acronyms. And then uh, typically you will have a chronological order to this. So this goes one, two, I think there's 42 um, total uh, interviews in here. Um, so that if there's one missing, you would know because uh, there is no four. It would just go from three to five. So you would know there's a missing interview as such. That's the idea anyways. Um, sometimes it depends on how things come to us, but we tend to try and get together a data listing and, and um, give everyone their own number. So Stan Cohen here is interview five. So you'd be able to go into, um, you'd be able to go into the RTF folder, um, interview transcript, and you'd be able to open up interview five there. And you would see once you open it up, you have turn taking, um, you have uh, speaker tags, um, and it, it tends to follow a very systematic kind of format. Um, 
again, there is some variation depending on how the uh, data comes to us. But if it's something that we've had any kind of hand in the curation of, it tends to have a, a quite um, a consistent look to the data. Okay. So um, the other question that came up was around readme files and my Zoom menu is just blocking this. So hold on one second. I can't go, can't go up, here we go. Um, so this readme file is actually quite an important file. It sometimes gets overlooked, um, but every collection will have a readme file. And it just talks a little bit about the data curation. It's just useful information to know. So here we can see there were 16 new interviews that were added in April 2019, and that the interview summaries and documentation were updated as part of that. But it also tells you what standard that uh, they used in the curation of that particular data set. It, it's not necessarily essential for, for working with the data per se, but it's really useful. It might impact some of the choices you make around the analysis of it. Um, so it's useful to have, just open up the README file and have a glance at it. Okay, um, were there any other questions that came up um, while you were having a look at that? Um, do pop them into the Q&A if you want, or into the chat. And I think we've got just a few more slides. I can reshare the slides, just a few more slides to go through. Um, hopefully you've found this useful in terms of getting started um, and you've got a bit of experience now looking at the documentation and the download bundles. Um, so hopefully you're ready to have a search through our data catalog um, and see what you can find. Uh, if you do, if you are interested in any other kind of training or information that we have, do feel free to get connected with us. We're on social media. We've got a YouTube channel with all the recordings of our training, um, as well as a contact us page um, on our website. If you're uh, on Disk Mail, we also have a mailing list and it will send out a sort of a weekly update of all of the new data publications that we have. Um, so do feel free to sign up to our Disk Mail list as well for those updates. We also have lots of other events like this. Um, so this was quite an introductory one for those who perhaps haven't reused data very much or just wanted to know a little bit more about the archive and what we have. Um, but we also have some uh, training events which get into some of the nitty gritty of research data management. So we have things like ethical and legal guidelines and data sharing. Um, we've got uh, some events around synthetic data coming up. Um, as well as uh, getting started with computational um, uh, social science. Um, we've got one on teaching coming up, as well as copyright and publishing. And then we also have some that are um, putting a spotlight on certain types of data. So we have qualitative and mixed methods, as well as I, uh, I think it's business data and census data, or is it longitudinal data? I forget which, which way they've titled it now. But um, do have a look if you're interested in certain data types as well. I think that's all of the questions answered. Um, hopefully this gets you started anyways. Um, and if you do have more questions that come up, um, feel free to pop us an email. Um, we can always clarify anything there. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, good luck with your research projects and hope, hopefully you can find some useful data in our archive. Thank you everyone for attending and don't forget to fill in the evaluation survey as well.